Welcome to Building Sustainability Podcast with me, your host, Jeffrey Hart, aka Jeffrey the Natural Builder. Every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers, and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Hello, and welcome to Building Sustainability, episode 65 which is the 2021 Christmas episode. Uh, Maybe you are listening on your way home for Christmas. Maybe you're wrapping your presents. I hope you're enjoying this wonderful festive season, even if Omicron is coming to get us. Um, Last year, I slapped some sleigh bells uh, into the Christmas episode intro, only for it to become one of the most listened to uh, episodes sort of throughout the rest of the year. So, um, so I'm sure everyone enjoyed that in spring. Uh, so none of that silliness this year. Um, so episode 65 is with Rachel Fowler, uh, an interior designer who focuses on healthy and sustainable interiors. I thought that after two very technical episodes with John Butler... We should go for something that maybe everyone can relate to. And I think probably everyone has redecorated or kind of given a space of a new look. So, yes, something that we can all get involved in. Um, And the more suspicious among you might say that it's awfully convenient for me to be talking to an interior designer as I'm approaching the finishing stages of my house build. And, well... I'd be lying if I said it wasn't related, but not because I'm super clever and scheming, but because all I can really think about is my build at the moment. It dominates the entirety of my brain. Uh, So scheduling guests is often just related to what I am thinking about in the build. So, yeah. Um, This episode has loads and loads of links uh, in the show notes. My friend Kirk said, what are the show notes? So uh, for the benefit of him and anyone else unsure, uh, they are the notes that appear with the podcast in your podcast software. Um, They are also on the Building Sustainability Podcast website, buildingsustainabilitypodcast.com. So do check those out. Big long list of links. Um, And we end by going through a whole big list of products and suggestions uh, for your own project. Um, So, yes, lots to take in. Uh, What else to tell you? The Building Sustainability Community on Facebook. Big thanks to John Butler, the the last two episodes. Uh, He has been on there answering people's questions and being an absolute champ. Really great to see some people feeding back and kind of getting involved in the the conversation which is the whole point this episode has a little bit of bonus audio that i'll stick up on the patreon page that's patreon.com forward slash building sustainability where you can go and support the podcast this is an independently made podcast so any contributions really help and that is exactly what Stuart loxley has done also gavin deacon I don't know if that's how you say your surname, Gavin. Uh, Gavin was the person who was giving great Twitter reviews uh, last week. Kenny Fallon. Uh, Kenny is, uh, at the moment, bringing back the Last Straw Journal. Um, So check out. Uh, I can't remember the link off the top of my head. uh, And my computer's just gone offline. So, uh, yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, Do check that out. Uh, Tom Joseph. Uh, Tom is actually an old neighbour of mine. He used to moor up just on the other side of the uh, the pontoon. So uh, hello, Tom. He's also just cycled to Athens to raise money for help refugees. Uh, and finally, Alex, who has no surname like Cher or Sting. But thank you anyway, Alex. And Alex, Gavin and Kenny have all gone for the Building Sustainability Superhero where they give five pounds and I send them a hand carved wooden spoon. And I just sent out a load of spoons last week and it felt good to get through some of the backlog. Uh, I've got a little way to go, but um, yeah, it felt good to be carving again, actually. What a nice thing to do with my time. Sat in my warm house 
that is also a building site. Anyway, I digress. I think that's everything from me. Uh, I am back at the end with a little bit of an outro. Yeah, here's Rachel. Enjoy. My design practice is all about sustainability, healthy and humane design. It's the health and well-being of my clients are central to everything that I do. Yeah, so I just want to try and change the world in how we design and work with like-minded people. Uh, so what sort of what sort of clients are you working for? Um, I'm currently working on a residential project actually in the UK. Um, and this is a house extension. And it works worth being in a different country and doing a project. Um, yeah, so it's just promoting the products, you know, advising the products. I've done all the CAD drawings, the technical drawings. Um, I've actually did a client specification sheet, which involves sourcing every kind of product that you could possibly think for the, the design. Um, obviously, clients sometimes will prefer to use the product that they would like to use. But it's about, I think when it comes to designing sustainably and healthily, it's a lot of if the client's people out there in generally still don't have the information because they see what's advertised in magazines I mean a lot of magazines are now searching for sustainability and a really good magazine is Enki Mag UK okay. they're a really good magazine if you are somebody out there looking for sustainable materials but the lot of knowledge set out there for your um, client it's quite limited unless they've done a lot of research into it, which some clients will do. They will do the research, but a lot of clients are kind of like, okay. But I think, like I said to you earlier, I think that the tide is turning and now people are becoming more aware climate change and the climate crisis, which is going on. I think people will start saying no to traditional products. Um, and yeah, and they'll be wanting the healthy and sustainable alternatives or in another, I always say to people, do you need to change things like your furniture? Can we not recycle this? So I'm always a big advocate of uh, reuse and recycle to promote circular design. So we're not filling up landfills and stuff. Great. Get out of that fashion industry. Get rid of the what you had. Get the new things just so that you can get rid of them five minutes later. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, this this client, for example, you're working at the moment, what? What's the brief that they come to you with? They basically come with like a design style. Well, they come with what they want and then it changes like quite a few times. Hmm. Um, yeah. And then I I go away and I look for the healthy options. Um, obviously, sometimes there can be a bit of a disconnect between the contractor and, my, and the, the client. The contractor will advise and you're just kind of like, that's not really what I would recommend for a healthy and sustainable alternative. Because a lot of people don't realise that the internal air quality within buildings is actually worse than outside. Mm. So what we're breathing in, what we put on our walls, what we build our walls with, how we light it, all the products that you use to build a house, apartment, it's what they're emitting into the environment. You know, it's not just the fact that should we change it? Do we need to change it? Um, what benefits is going to give us? But the materials we're using... What are they emitting? What's their, their carbon footprint? So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It can be very infuriating when people just use products, standard products that actually aren't low or, not, or VOC. So, yeah, I think I really feel like more needs to be done for teaching and advertising on the the effects of VOCs in the environment in our in our living and it's not just living it's working spaces too I, mean, I think it's it's very difficult for you know the the lay person to if they're being told this is an eco product you know by the the, the tin of paint uh you know this is a low VOC breathable <laughs> product it might say and uh <laughs> you know I'm thinking of particular paint brands Oh yes, I have. I, they all they are all flying into my mind too, <laughs> and it, and they are just like greenwashing. Yeah, so. exactly. And so you know the the sort of normal person is going to go. Well, this is good. I you know I know these terms. I'm I'll choose this this paint. 
it's it's very difficult because it's yeah as you said it's a lot of digging and it's a lot of research to actually understand what are the things that are, that are harmful and what are the alternatives yes i mean people have asked me this so how can you prevent greenwashing hmm. it's basically i always say to clients well or or friends as well that come for advice and like if it says organic has is it got backing up on that packaging to say it you know is it third party certified? Um, because if it's not third party certified, like Declare or Cradle to Cradle or Blue Angel and stuff, then you should start questioning, well, actually, is this what it says it is? But then on the other hand, to get like Cradle to Cradle um, or Declare or certified, you have to, p- companies have to pay quite a lot of money. These these aren't free certifications that people get. I mean, I have looked into Cradle to Cradle myself. I did some digging research. And you're looking at something like, I think it was $12,000. It all goes on how much revenue you break in a year. And I'm like, well, for a new business that's wanting to be sustainable, products are sustainable, to get that certification, unless you've got investors to do it, once, you get your, once you've done your product and it's there to market, it's having that money to get, so not ever, and I and this was brought up on a course I did with the Health Materials Lab in New York at yeah. the New School U- University, and they said some companies can't afford this initially. So yes, look for the third party cert, like in the big brands, look for that third party certification, especially on your paints, because you know if they are what they say they are, then they are. But for the smaller brands, contact that company. Do that, you know, just take a phone call. I mean, email, it's easy for somebody to say, oh, yeah. But if you ring a company, you can generally tell in a tone of voice. Or they. I always think if you speak to someone, it's better than just getting an email. Mm, absolutely, yeah. So it's really hard. Greenwashing is, is massive in the design industry. Um, like you say, fashion and interior architectural design. But, yeah, it's just, I, I like to dig deep. And I, I will phone companies and then I'll just be like, actually, I don't understand this. What actually is this? Or there's, um, I know a lot of architects and designers are now on the red list from the Living Building Challenge. But your your general person in the Joe public is not going to know about the red list, I don't think. And that I think more needs to be done if people could see, OK, I can see this tin of paint or um, this floor cover or whatever, or what I want to use this product on the wall. But it says this, what are these items that are in it? Explore it. You know, yeah. and another thing I hate is plastic. I just it's just I just can't stand plastic and how it gets into a lot of products. An example of that would be Um Oh wallpaper. Oh really? Yes, yes, there's plastic in some uh, wallpapers. Yes, Why? I have to be very careful because yes. <laughs> I can't tell you more. I, and I know this because I'm just developing my own biodegradable wallpaper. And this is we are when the samples rock up that I can see what my design's like. But yeah, a certain type of wallpaper has got plastic in. Oh. So that's why, yeah, everyone knows that vinyl wallpaper's got plastic in. And vinyl wallpaper is the, what it's emitting into the environment is good. But there is, yeah, there's another type of wallpaper that has plastic. So when you're shopping for wallpaper, check to see what's in it. Because it says paper in the name, no, you, you just uh, wouldn't even assume it, would you? No, no. I, I, When I got my sample pack through and I thought, oh, this one's quite nice. So I went back to the manufacturer. It's a really good company in the UK. And the paper is actually made, well, printed using machines which are made from using recycled energy. So it's not actually drawing from the grid. And he said, oh, that's got plastic in it. I'm like, oh, I can't have that. That goes against my USP. Everything about me and my business, I, I can't do that. So he's just like, yeah, there's plastic in it. And I'm just like, well, what options do I have? So he said, you can use traditional paper in the, like 20 years ago. Um, but they've just developed a new product, a paper in Germany. Um, so we're going with this. I've had the spec. Yeah, it's been a lot of work to, for my own peace of mind, to show that I'm, my product is what it says it is. Oh, great. Well, well done for, for persevering. And yeah, I mean, it's, it shows, doesn't it, that you just need to ask questions and, and probe and get beneath the surface. And certainly assumptions, you know, 
my yeah. assumption is wallpaper is made of paper. I think a lot of people would, would be on the same wavelength as that. And it's not just about plastics either. It's about the other chemicals that go onto products or into products. Mm. Um, I mean, especially like in the UK, most furniture has to be covered in fire retardants. Yeah. Which that's part of the, comes back to the petrochemical companies. I I, I only really fell upon that when I um, approached a, a really good company in the UK. I was intrigued by their product. It's uh, they that they were doing vegan and sustainable mattresses. I'm like, okay. I was quite intrigued by this. Yeah, they went through a lot. All their mattresses don't have the fire retardant and stuff on. So for their, which was great because if you say a normal mattress, I don't know if you're a heavy person that sweats at night, you're sweating onto the mattress and your skin is absorbing what chemicals are on your bed mm. and this is the same with your sofa armchair and products that say are uh, you don't need to iron you're just like okay they've got formaldehyde in so is that, is that what it is yeah so oh, it's not iron so it's got products like formaldehyde in so it's just it's just getting the information out there there are other designers that are on this and are are educating people but i think more needs to be done to educate people but like the mattress company that I interviewed, that I had an interview with, they just said, you can put it out there, but the big companies that produce the chemicals don't like it. So it will get taken down and magazines and newspapers will. So it's very, it's one of those things that you have to be very careful about, which is ridiculous, really, because at the end of the day, it comes down to the environment of the planet and the people's health. Mm. Yeah, trying to uh, make people not get sick shouldn't be yes, a, a yes. thing you have to fight for, is it? Yeah, I mean, some of the chemicals and stuff that are used in products, I mean, I learned this from the Healthy Materials Lab from the New School of New York, and it can affect your endocrine, your reproductive system, respiratory. Um, a, a prime example that I like to use is like what's on your floor. If you've got a brand new baby or if you've got a pet, mm. children spend a lot of their time on the floor, the animals spend a lot of time on their floor. And if you've got a flooring which is covered in a lacquer, which has got chemicals in, that's not plant-based and organic, then the children are going to lick their hands, they'll ingest it, um, or pets will lick their paws and stuff. And so, yeah, it's kind of, it's very interesting when you, it fascinates me because before I was interior design, like I said, I was an intensive care nurse for 15 mm-hmm. years. So how this, how the products we're actually using is affecting the body systems, I find shocking and, and why we are, as designers, not advocating doing more to get this information out there. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, the flame retardant one is a, a really interesting thing because, I mean, first of all, it doesn't stop the thing burning. It just slows no. it down. And when those chemicals themselves are heated up, they release oh, yeah. incredibly toxic chemicals. Yeah. So, I mean, the the logic there is so backwards. It's, yes. Yeah, and that's that's not even considering, you know, just their day to day. You know, you they'll drop a bit of food on your sofa and pick it up yeah, and eat yeah. it. It's like, oh, you've just yeah, eaten, yeah. eaten this. Yes. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what it, it makes you. I think when you're designing or you're doing a project, if people and not everyone can afford an interior designer or an architect, you know it. I was a nurse before. I could never afford an interior designer on my salary. So it's given this, like people like yourself that do these podcasts, it's enabling people to gain the information, think, okay, this is how I this is how I can make sure that my living space or my working space is gonna pr- promote the health and well being of everybody around me. Yeah, great. Well, I mean, yeah, there's so much I want to talk about and I'd like to come later on to sort of talking about how people can can sort of or what some of the options people can can choose for for uh, sort of you know, their own projects but i wanted to talk a little bit about vegan design now excuse me for being ignorant uh would wool be a not acceptable in a vegan uh, design if you ask for vegans no you couldn't use wool they okay. wouldn't they they don't Anything to related with an animal, they would not let you, you cannot use in their design. It is purely you have to look for alternative um, products and stuff. So, and mm. there are other materials that you can use out there. 
to um, to combat that. Um, that is a shame because in terms of a sort of sustainable material, uh, then wool is, I, mean, I imagine it's just one of the, the best. It's, it's always interesting, and I, I say this a lot, it's, um, you know, when people say what's the best product for this or what's the best answer, the answer is always, you know, it depends because it depends what particular subset of uh, criteria you're you're looking at it with and if you're you know, throwing vegan into the sustainable world adds in a whole different you dimension know, exactly yeah yeah because you have to as in my book it might be vegan but it might not then it because there's a possibility it won't be sustainable mm. and if it's sustainable there's a possibility it might not be vegan so <laughs> it's just like yes okay so this is another time when you have to really go back to that manufacturer and say, this is vegan, but what else is in my product? Yeah. Is it actually promoting my health and well-being? I think it's changed now, but certainly when I was looking a few years ago, it seemed that things like vegan leather were just plastic. Now it's totally different. And I actually had this, I suppose, a conundrum. Mm. Say, so, okay, because some of the um, vegan leathers that are out there do made from certain plant-based products do contain plastic Mm. so I was kind of like I had this conundrum and I went back to the place in New York I said which is the best alternative because you're not allowed to call it leather it's the alternative to leather because Mm -hmm. it's yeah I got told please don't call it leather it has to be called an alternative to leather because it's not made from animal skin and I said which is the best to use what what would I recommend my clients you know there's so many opportunities there's so many different options out there and for the interior design um is pinatex which is ah. yes it is an alternative lever made from pineapple oh wow yes so i I had this quandrum for a few months this year and i'm like oh my gosh if i recommend this you know um, is it going to make me liable is there plastic in it Um, is this healthy is it sustainable so Yes, they they recommended that Pinatex. So it's a it's a minefield even for a designer for making sure <laughs> that, yeah, that there's nothing else hiding below that label. Yeah, that's interesting. And then of course you start thinking, well, where are the pineapples coming from? And oh, oh it, it's it's the left it's the leftover pineapple bits. Yeah. So there, so you'll actually find a lot of the I always describe alternative leather. Um that's what I've been called to call it as if you look at it, it's like your shopping list Hmm. because a lot of it is made of made out of fruit and bits and pieces. Yeah. It's just making sure that if you have a vegan leather or you're going for vegan leather, that they haven't used plastic in it. Yeah. Oh, so much digging. (laughs) Yes. It's um, I've, um, I've been using a little bit of uh, sheep's wool insulation in my, uh, in my house that I'm building at the moment and okay they they mix in a little bit of plastic in with that uh recycled okay. bottles I think it gives gives it the the sort of springiness so that it stays because okay. it needs to be expanded to be insulated yeah. yes yeah, so there's a little bit of plastic in there and I just suddenly thought you know like any little bits that blow away into the wind they are I'm just microplastic polluting you know, yeah this, what I think of as an brilliant natural material so i can't compost it i can't you know no, because all it's got of those in. little scraps yeah have to go in the bin because i can't separate it it's a yeah it's a nightmare there's um a good insulation that's uh came out was at the beginning of the year everything seems to roll into one at the moment um <laughs> and it's using mushroom mycelium oh yes as an insulation that's becoming popular and within the design world you would not believe what mushroom mycelium is it's being used for they use it for alternative leather yes um for flooring which is an italian company called mogu have designed this flooring and you can take it once it's finished with it can, they can basically dismantle it and reuse it again take Fantastic. it back to yeah so are they yeah. is that the company they also do wall coverings uh, yeah they do uh, panels. yeah that's the one oh, yeah, i just yeah, had yeah. a massive nerd out at their website <laughs> just last week it's so beautiful yeah they are really good i i i because they're in my book and i contacted them and they're such a nice company they were so helpful and they do this flooring 
And I said, but is it waterproof? And she's like, oh, yeah, it's waterproof. And they're on there. If you go on their website, they've got images of um, in that they've used it in lots of retail in shops and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but the thing with this flooring is that once you, if after a while, I'm not sure the life, the, the longevity of it, but I'm sure it must be quite a long time because of a sustainable product. Yeah. But when it has to come up, they can recycle it. That's fantastic. perfect for a circular economy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that, that is the, the circular economy just right there, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, I think, you know, it seems like mycelium, just knowledge of mycelium and the uses, well, how it works in the natural world, uh, you know, sort of communication between trees and, and things like that. I think that is getting more and more understood now. But, you know, the, the things that people are doing, um, I chatted last week about the biome uh, who are the UK. They were making the insulation. Um, I don't okay. think it's quite quite a product yet, but... They've just uh, released a load of uh, lampshades made from, well, grown on discarded coffee grounds and orange peels. Oh, to wow. Make these sort of mycelium lampshades. They're beautiful things. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Please yeah. send me the link to. Of course, to that, I will. That would be really good. But there's a woman in um, the US that she makes lampshades out of my, mushroom mycelium. It's just. Oh, okay, we'll you, trade you, links you, then. Yes, yeah. That's just, um, oh, what's she called? Mushloom? Something, it's not, I'm probably doing a really big disjustice, so I do apologise. <laughs> but, yeah, it's amazing what products are out there. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, it is a minefield, but it's just a case of looking. Yeah. Okay, well, great. Um, so a question I want to ask you, and... This is, uh, you know, don't take this as an insult. This is coming from a place of being a designer myself uh, or trained as a designer. Um, the, the term sustainable interior design feels a little bit like an oxymoron when, I mean, to me, I think of interior design as kind of part of the fashion industry, sort of changing fashions, you know, as faster and faster fashion cycles so that we can you know, ship out the old stuff, get new stuff, you know, repeat so do you, I mean, first of all, do you think that's, do you think that's the case with interior design? And also, you know, how, how do you think you're doing it differently to that? Yes, there is a thought that interior design, I mean, people might say that this is not so, but from what I've read, the interior design is slightly behind fashion because fashion design is a massive thing, isn't it? It's a massive industry. Mm. Um, there are companies now from doing the Ellen MacArthur seven-week circular design. There are actually companies now, like I think it's Levi's, that put little chips in their clothes and it goes, you can take send it back if you don't want it anymore to this it's a company that's designed this. I think they're in Denmark. So the, the garment basically keeps going out to different people so it doesn't just end up in a bin. Oh, right, like as a yeah. whole thing rather than... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So there's this company in Copenhagen, I think they're in Copenhagen, I might be wrong, but basically, companies can join this scheme, and I think what, if I can remember rightly, they put li- all they do is they put a little chip into it, and then it, when the someone doesn't want it, they just—I'm not sure how they monitor it. They they send it to this warehouse, or whatever, and it goes out to somebody else can buy it. So it's it's like a continual recycling of a pair of jeans where those jeans should travel. But the interior design industry, yes, the trends thing is a bit of an issue. Um, mm. Personally, I I wrote, I wrote a blog article. Will this be the change? Will this be the change in the interior design industry? Because obviously you can see in the fashion industry because circular design and people think, actually, I just don't want to keep buying all this stuff. Or, you know, why are you not giving me another option? If you, I think it's this year or last year, more people bought secondhand clothes than they did brand new clothes. Fantastic. So if you look in the interior design world, I always say, well, actually, you've got the old chair. Why can't we just reuse it let's find you know if it's worn let's get another fabric let's reupholster it you know or let's sand something down let's recycle these things or don't don't take it to the tip who else can you use it um and you know try selling it there's lots of like in the uk you've got free cycle or around the world you've got ebay and if that doesn't work there's i was speaking to somebody in the u.s i've got a very a friend i've become in the u.s that works with the green buildings and stuff and she said well if that doesn't work what about low income 
afford, um, like social housing, donate the furniture to social housing, it's getting a new life. Then it's being recycled. It's not ending up in that landfill. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think, I don't know, when you see interior design and you look in the magazines, you see new trends, but is it, I think it's changing. I do think that the trends are going to are slowing down. I think because people are more conscious what they're buying. Um, yeah, it's it's really hard. I think as, as designers, we have we have a responsibility to say, you know, don't chuck this away. Let's reuse it somewhere, or where else can you can you sell it to somebody else? There's always something like people leave in university. You know, or I mean, I worked in Australia in Sydney as a nurse. I lived with three other girls, nursing accommodation. We didn't want to buy furniture. We bought secondhand furniture. Oh my goodness, my sofa, the sofa we had was amazing. It was a 1970s bright floral sofa. Nice. And it was the talking piece when people <laughs> used to come around. And then, I mean, I left before the other guys did, but they just resold the furniture. And I, I don't know if my if that floral sofa is still alive today and kick in. But you know what? It's all, yeah, just there's so many options you can do. And I think com- companies are becoming, even the, in the hospitality design, I think people are becoming more conscious. And the people that are using the hospitality design, like the younger generation in the 20s and, and early 30s now saying, well, is this really healthy for me? You know, am I actually staying in a hotel that's promoting my health? Or am I just breathing in chemicals whilst I'm relaxing in this beautiful space? So I think it is changing. Trends are an issue, but I think things are changing in a positive mindset. I think the wheels are t- turning in the right in the right way. Do you think sustainability is a trend? Do you think it's and I guess a trend has a you know a start and an end like you know yo-yos are a, are a trend or they are repeatedly a trend uh, and then they're all chucked away again at the end. Is that going to happen with sort of sustainable products and design well if a product is sustainable it should last shouldn't it Mm. it should last you know it shouldn't i don't think it i i i must admit someone says oh sustainability design interior design is just a trend and i'm like well no it's not why it's how this is the way we need to live this if you want to save the climate if you want your family or your work colleagues to live and work in a healthy environment this is this is the future just you know, we need to move away from that linear approach of like, oh, every five years we need to change this and say, no, stop it. Mm. You know, if you're good design in a space, design it sustainably so that you're not damaging the planet, having to keep buying products. When you buy an object, OK, how long is this going to last? Is this really going to last? Is this actually what I might need it for? So sustainability of trend. No, I actually see... With the groups that I belong to, I actually see this is growing. And I think consumers are becoming more aware that this is what they want. And it's it's trendy now to buy secondhand and to always go and buy brand new. So, yeah, yeah, I think a couple of years ago, yes, I would, sustainability is a trend because companies say I'm sustainable. You look at me. Um, but now I, I'm quite prepared to grill people if they think... <laughs> Oh, is this, is this, and they're like, I'm not doing this for a trend. I'm doing this for your health and well-being and to protect the planet. Yeah. To live beautiful. My motto is live beautifully. And you can do that with, by just doing it naturally and sustainably. Not everything is going to be sustainable because sometimes there are certain, certain situations when you're not going to be able to get everything as a hundred percent that you want it. But if you can aim to get the majority of it or most of it, then, yeah. I mean, I mean, I was listening to a webinar the other week and it was about linoleum and it's a linoleum, not linoleum flooring that we have that you lay down in sheets and then Mm. you get someone comes in and cuts it and seals it. There's a linoleum now, which basically they pour it on. So there's no joins and it's just like, wow, this is amazing this is totally amazing. You know, there's no glue needed to put it down. It's just like, wow. And that's cork dust and linseed oil, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's natural materials. Yeah. And it's just, there's so much, oh, it is changing. It is frustrating at times when you see products being advertised, just like, 
Oh my goodness. I mean, like yesterday, I had an email from Green Matters on their newsletter saying companies are now avoiding a boycott in Black Friday. And I'm like, well, this is amazing. Because if companies are now realizing that, why are we doing this? Because if people are just going to buy stuff that they don't need. So to see people, to see companies now saying, we're not going to be doing this anymore. The tide is turning. That's, that's where I see it. Great. I'm pleased because I feel, uh, uh, I mean, I have moments of being completely overwhelmed by, you know, the, the sort of Walmart style, uh, oh. big, cheap, nasty, uh, throwaway culture you know certainly a, like halloween is always a bit of a bit of a horrible one for me it's like you know how much oh yeah how much the plastic plastic, lift, plastic cauldrons and stuff yeah and it's ironic because they put sweets in it now if the sweets <laughs> aren't course. covered you're putting sweets in a plastic tub and then the, the then the sweets are going in the child's mouth and just like that's just been on plastic yeah and now instead of just yeah they're absorbing stuff that's coming off the plastic I, uh, it's just you need to do this healthy materials lab and buildings course if, if you're interested yeah please the, tell me about that that the new school um university in new york is i mean i've never heard about green chemistry i sat there thinking green chemistry wow chemistry at school involved you know naughty sticking the pen in a bunsen burner see how quick it would burn <laughs> and all the other chemicals but yeah there's just so much so much going on and it's it's super interesting super super interesting ah great have you um speaking of sort of courses uh have you looked at the building biology no i, I haven't but it sounds very interesting yes i saw a, a sort of breakneck speed presentation from a a very uh very insightful but very sort of monotone uh chap okay. and i was just and i was just like hoovering it all in and he was just talking about all these different materials like this does this and this is full of this and you know this that and i was like this is a course i absolutely have to do and as soon um, as i'm done building my house and filling it with probably the wrong materials i will <laughs> i will do it yeah that, that sounds very much like the healthy healthy building and healthy materials course that this it's a three month course yeah um, and it's not an expensive course but it was a it was just like, oh, when you get frustrated and I just finished my book, I was just like, okay, I need more. I need to know more. And so another interior designer recommended this course and it's absolutely amazing. And, and you just think, look at carpets and stuff. Oh my God, the carpet, what's it made of? Oh, your child's on that carpet. Oh my God, your pet's on that carpet. What are you, what are you doing? So it just covered, it just like, yeah, we could breathe it in, but we actually ingest lots of stuff. Yeah, um, and our but, skin absorbs it. So, it's, yeah, it's, it was just a totally amazing course. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey there, I'm Mick from the Mick and Pat Show. That's right, and I'm Pat. Looking for a podcast that's like catching up with old friends? Well, you're in luck. We're here to bring you weekly doses of lifestyle commentary, discuss culture and politics, and top it off with the occasional beer and film reviews. But it's not just about us. We're a community. Our listeners are our kin, and we let you all have a say in what we discuss. So saddle up and join the conversation at The Mick and Pat Show. You can check out our website or find us wherever you get your podcasts. Great. There's there's always that thing, isn't there, when people walk into like a, a newly carpeted room and go like, hmm, that new carpet smell. <laughs> like, you know what you're smelling, don't you? That's Stain awesome. retardant. Yeah. Yeah, stain <laughs> retardant. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not all carpets are like that because there are natural carpet companies out there mm -hmm. um so and there's natural backings now and the underlay there's an underlay a natural underlay so you don't have to get the underlay that's got full of nasty stuff as i'd say there's yeah things are changing so. yeah I, mean, I I feel like I should uh, plug Earth Floors uh, while while we're talking about this, but um, uh, yeah, I did a, an Earth Floor re well a few years ago actually for a, a guy who built a passive house, and he had these wonderful carpets in the areas that weren't weren't earth floored. He had uh, sort of jute and natural fibred okay. carpets, yeah, uh, kind of quite thick weaved, almost like um, the sort of what were they like? I don't know. They were. They felt fantastic on your feet. 
Um, yeah, not yeah. sort of like a carpet that you would natch, you know, that sort yeah, of Yeah, I know fluffy. what you mean, like the, the grass carpet, Cecil and Hugh yes, and all that. Yes, exactly, yeah. And the two of the, when that butted up against an earth floor, the, you know, natural, meeting natural, it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, there's a really good company in the UK that does that kind of flooring. Is there? Uh, yeah, Cecil, Cecil uh, I can never pronounce it, Cecil. Sizzle and shoot. Yeah, and they, yeah. Natural. I have a feeling they Sorry. might be in Bristol. Oh my goodness. Now you're uh, hopefully making my brain think. No, I'm not sure. Don't. Well, <laughs> I'll put a link in but, the show notes and everyone can just uh, click that. And, but yeah. they are a really good, they're a really good company. So, uh, sort of going back a little bit, I feel like we may be jumping all over the place, but I think I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, circular economy. I mean, it's it's a thing that uh, I think a lot of people know the term a lot, but probably, or yeah, I've heard the term, but I don't think they necessarily know how how it works in the real world. Like, mm-hmm. what, can you give some examples of, of you know, the circular economy in action? Okay. So obviously, circular economy is it's not that new because it has been in a few years. Well, because obviously you had your the previous way was the linear approach where you buy, use and dispose. So now you've got the circular economy. Um, and I think the easiest way to describe it for people is to look at the life cycle of a product. So if you're thinking circular design, we're buying a product, think life cycle. So what's it made of? What's its manufacturing processes? The transportation of the product, where's it come from? Um, the longevity, I always like to think of the longevity of a product. And then the end of life. What happens at the end of life of that product? Does it, is it recyclable, reusable, or biodegradable? So for, like we spoke about earlier, a lot of things that contain plastic, obviously, that doesn't follow through. I mean, you... When I did the circular economy course, they did put, well, you can have use plastic bottles and make a plastic picnic table. But at the end of the life of that recycled plastic picnic table, what will happen to it then? Can it then be reused again? And they did say some of them can't be. So, yeah, it's 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 a really interesting concept. I mean, there's a company, it's a design product. There's a company in um, Italy that have got a wallpaper that you can put on the wall. It's, it comes off. It's biodegradable. You can put it back in the ground. It's like Mogo. They're flooring. It's a circular economy. They grow it. There's no chemicals. They put it together. They It can be installed. At the end of your life, it's, it's um, biodegradable or they can reuse it. So it's getting into the concept of instead of just, you know, make, buy, throw away it's recycling what's it made of um how is it made because I, as i was pointed out by this other really nice designer she said it, it's you can think of circular economy and sustainable design but you always need to think about the communities and the people that make it who makes that product and and the communities around it how does that affect them because that's another key issue to, you know are they treated well are the chemicals they're using, if they're using chemicals, obviously possibility that you can't use it as a circular product. So and how are these people affected? How are they paid? Are they treated fairly? So I think circular design for me, it encompasses a lot. I always tend to say, look at the life cycle of a product. And when you're looking at the where it comes from and the manufacturing, don't forget to look at the communities and the people that make it. Mm-hmm. And I guess I mean, what I've been thinking about when you've been talking about the, the sort of furniture, so like the idea of re you know selling on your sofa or recovering a sofa, I and mean, that sort of need you know the step before that or the step before you're know, using it is that you need to buy kind of something that's good quality, don't you? I mean, if if it's not yes. going to be you know go straight, to, maybe it's a metal product. Uh, and it's yes. you know, not going to buy the grade, like buying something that's not going to break and, you know, is actually yeah. worth keeping hold of and, you know, has some value. Yes. Um, there are companies, I know IKEA, I does in several, I'm not sure if it's in every country. They, if you buy products from them, you can return them to their stores at the end of life. So 
some companies are now offering this kind of service. Well, do you know you can hire furniture? Oh, really? There are, yeah, there are companies out there that before the pandemic, and I'm sure they're still going, that you could hire furniture. So if you're wanting to save for a certain piece of furniture, you can hire furniture. That's interesting. Joe, yes. I, I saw a thing about, it was talking about circular economy, and it was talking about how um, lift companies are now becoming, uh, sort of the manufacturers of lifts for buildings are now becoming, they sort of lease out the, the lift uh, yeah. rather than selling it to the, you know, you don't buy a lift, you just you, you pay the rent on it. Yeah. Um, so that then, you know, they can take it back out again at the end and it's, you know, they are reusing it. Um, mm. So it's an interesting sort of change in our, yeah, sort of societal change, I guess. Well, like, if you think about, if you buy, I don't know, what's the easiest thing? A table. You know, if you buy a table that's made of screws, mm. traditional method, and not glue, when you're finished with that table, you can unscrew it and you can use the top or the parts for something else. It's getting away from the quick fix of let's just stick this together or no more nails. It's using, it's and, and I was taught this in that course, it's going back to using nails and screws mm. and get and use and away from products to, to get away from sticking things. Yeah. And that's so. The, there's a thing I want to talk about, um, and that's nurseries. Uh, oh, yes. I, I saw a little bit on your website about this and it's, it's always kind of like really frustrated me. Uh, the the classic thing, isn't it? Yeah, you're going to have a child, so you repaint the the spare room with your you know your, <laughs> your low VOC breathable paint, uh, and you put, <laughs> put new carpet in there, and you buy the new cot, and you you do all these things, and yeah, you're just giving this newborn newborn life like a, a toxic little room to. Uh, Yes, yes. If you're designing a nursery, um, yes. If you're going to use carpet, check for a carpet that's got a that's not had the backing glue to it. That it's made from. If you are having world, see it's not no fire, fire retardants and stain retardants on. I mean, do you really need to put a carpet in a nursery? I know most people do. Why not go for like a a nice rug, a bohemian style rug, or a rug that's made from shoot or sisal, like we spoke about earlier. Yeah, and the cot, if you're buying a cot, look for a cot that's made from FSC wood. Mm-hmm. If you're a, a Forestry Stewardship Council wood, that's what it stands for. Um, but it's not just about the wood. What is the cot coated in? Because you see cots painted white and they're just like, okay, is that a healthy paint or is that not a healthy paint? So let's see what the finish is made of. If it's just lacquered, is that a healthy lacquer? Um, and then going back to mattresses, you know, Check that that mattress isn't covered in fire retardants. Don't buy non-ironable bedding. That's not good. Um, and buy buy cot if you're buying blankets and stuff like that. Go for got certified because got certified means there's no pesticides and insecticides used to grow the cotton. Um, amazing blackout got lines. Is that G-O-T? got? Yeah, G O G O T S. I can't remember what it stands for. I break, um, but got certified blackout blinds. Do some investigating on them because they're actually things stuck together. Oh, so, no, I've just yes. bought one of those. <laughs> oh, no. So, but go back and have a look at it because you could create your own blackout blind. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, blackout blinds can be st- uh, materials stuck together. And is that glue used for that? Is it contained formaldehyde? That would be a question I'd be asking. I think it's crazy uh, that the formaldehyde formaldehyde in uh non-iron stuff but in the the building trade you know there was quite a big push to take formaldehyde out of uh ply and you know chipboard and sort of sheet materials but crazy that it's still being put into you know actual materials that you spend you know nearly half of your life under yeah that's mad so yeah but they don't tell you there's there's one thing I, I did say that when you're buying a product like paint and uh, for an example, not every ingredient has to be listed on that tin of paint if it's below a certain amount. Right. So if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty and know everything that is in a product like a sealant, 
um, a paint, grout. Um, always just double, like I said, you only just double check that there is everything, there's nothing missing from that label. But this is where the declare label comes in because declare labels, people have got a declare label on it. it there's generally most of the things in that product are on that label. Uh -huh. So it's just, yeah, you just, it's a bit of a minefield. And, and getting uh -huh. back to children's nurseries, why buy a changing tray when you could get a chest of drawers, put the, the thingy, the changing mat on top of there, because then that chest of drawers is going to grow with your child. Mm -hmm. So you're not having to get rid of a changing table um, in four or five years. Yeah. So it's just... Yeah, it's just been thinking savvy. Okay, my, my baby's going to grow and I want everything to grow with it. How can I do this? Excellent. All right. Well, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to finish just by, by let's, if we, if we imagine that, uh, you know, I've got a, let's call it like a Victorian mid-terrace house in, you know, a city in the UK. Uh, and I'm, I'm re- just moved in and I'm I'm sort of putting my own my own stamp on it. Can we go through some of the things that uh maybe like let's go for could we do sort of best and worst? Like Okay. Yeah. I'll have to be really careful that I don't say any products here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you will you'll have to edit them out, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's just so easy to let things slip, isn't it? Like, oh, did I say that? And it's quite often you don't even realise a thing is a product name. Yes. You know, like yeah, they've yeah, become yeah synonymous um so all right so we're gonna well maybe we're gonna put some plaster on the walls okay what would you what would you say sort of best and worst might be uh, there's a great um a great alternative product called clay plaster walls mm -hmm. and they are based in i think they're called clay works with brains clay works yes, yes. They've, they, they've done an episode with us yes and their products are absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, to be honest, I think they would suit most interiors. But I think you first off, you need to, to choose your design style and then stick with that all the way through. Of course, I've jumped ahead of the design element. There, that's I'm, all right. I've gone straight into materials. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, there's also um, Japanese lime plaster, mm. which has been around for years. Um, and that is a natural base product too. Yeah, I so mean, I should that, say that we have a, a rich heritage of uh, lime plaster in the yep. UK. Um, yeah, doesn't have to have to be the Japanese stuff. Although yeah, yeah, yeah. generally, plas Japanese plastering is you know the top top yeah. quality. Um, so there's there's those options. Okay, and uh, what about if we were going to put some colour on the wall? Oh um, please. <laughs> <laughs> This is why I have to be very careful. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll tread lightly. So if you're going to put colour there, first thing, if you're designing the whole house, make sure your colour flows through the whole house. Mm -hmm. So your house is not so end up being so psychedelic that everyone that walks in there is feeling, oh, stressed. And like, oh my goodness, I need to get out of here. I can't relax. Make sure your the colours flow from every room throughout the yeah. whole house. Um, and then when it comes to choosing the colour of paint or the choosing the paint, this is when I recommend that one thing that I say to people is don't scrimp on the on the cost of the paint. What mm. you pay for is what you get. Yeah. Um, this is where it comes into the fact that not all the ingredients can be listed on the tin. This applies massively for paint. If it's under a certain amount, they don't include it. Don't always believe what it says on the tin of paint. Yeah. Um might not be made of plant-based and it might not be organic like it's advertising itself to be um there is a very good company in the uk um that is plant-based paint and it has been created by an interior designer because he got really frustrated is that uh edward bulmer Yes, that's correct. Do you know what? I learned that from your website last night. And Did you? <laughs> straight on and, and ordered a, a colour card. Uh, absolutely amazing. And I spoke with Emma Bulmer. Um, absolutely. Really nice company. The whole team is so nice. They are in my book. And there is Graffinstone have just worked with another designer who've created a lime-based paint. Mm -hmm. And that is a rosy uniac. U-N-I-A-C-K-E-E. -E. 
So okay. they've just um, so and that paint is cradle to cradle um, certified. So I, those are two companies I recommend. There are other companies in my book, and if you're in America, they I know they're trying to get rid of a paint contained latex, latex mm. so your walls can't breathe. Um, yeah, and even on your woodwork paint, the same again. If you're painting your woodwork. Just check what is in that tin. Don't always believe what, believe what is said on that tin because you could end up with a paint that's actually off-gassing quite a lot in your space. Yeah. Uh, do you have, speaking of which, and this is very much like a, I want to know because I'm for my house, like a wood, a sort of wax or an oil finish? Yes. A company that you could look is go to Uro, A-U-R-O. Okay. Um, they are, a lot of their products are plant-based. But they are a good company to start with. Great, I will look them up. Thank you. This isn't just That's all right. this. This podcast isn't just about me. A shopping uh, list. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting my no. free uh, my free no, hour no. of. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm renovating my house. What can I use? So yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, what about so we've we've sort of spoken about floors. Um, yeah, I think we've we've probably covered that unless there's. What about cork floors? How are oh, they? Oh, cork flooring's really good. Is it? I've Do often you, uh, wondered, like, they got a shiny surface on them that made well, me a co- little bit, like... You can get cork floor tiles, make sure there's nothing nasty in there. But I did research this. They The good thing about cork is you can use it on your walls as well. Mm-hmm. And the good thing about cork is that it's waterproof and it can insulate your space. So if you've got... If you want to put cork down, it will insulate your floor and it will insulate your space so you've got no drafts coming up. It's at its end of life, it's biodegradable. Um, and cork comes from a tree. Is it grown in Portugal or Spain? Yeah, I think it's Portugal. 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 And the trees aren't cut down. It basically comes off the tree. Mm-hmm. So there's no detrimental damage to that tree. So cork is is a really good product. Yes, people often will say like, oh, cork's not a sustainable product. You know, you're damaging the tree. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> that tree it comes lives off on. The tr- yeah. yeah, yes, it's yes. It's like taking off its jacket and then it grows a new jacket. Um, yes. That's good. I am, So I've been researching cork recently and the sticking point, haha, accidental pun, uh, was the glues that we used to, to stick it on. I couldn't really find any information about whether they were well i was looking mostly about breathability okay um, but i don't know about the other sort of i wasn't necessarily looking at chemical contents there will be options out there you're not going to be the first person asking no, this so there will be alternatives to normal glue because you can get alternatives for everything else we've talked about sort of furniture you know so i uh i am well, I looked for a long time at look for a for a sofa, and then I realised that I was just going to uh, get one off of uh, eBay or Gumtree or or somewhere like that because there's loads of them. Everyone's getting rid of a sofa. Yes, and you know what? And not all the products inside it will be healthy. Yeah, but it's off gassed. Mm. The off gassing, the large amount that off gassing will have completed it's it's still off gas because things will get off gas all the time. But that initial woo. Yeah, of that that furniture will have smell. gone. Yes, which everyone loves. I'm like, oh, cuts. <laughs> so, and also, if you're buying new furniture, it always comes wrapped in plastic. So you, people, they say, let the furniture air before you put it in your space. If you have the room, not everybody yeah. has the room, but if a so, space if you're with a sofa, that's tricky, isn't it? But uh, yeah, what sort of time are you? What, what, how long are we talking? A week or so. But okay. to be honest, so long as you ventilate that space. You know, it's just like, okay, you're, ba- you're getting the room ready for your baby. Ventilate the space. Like, even if you've got nice paint, just ventilate it. Open the windows and just let the air in. So same with furniture. If you're buying brand new and you're not sure what's in it, but you still want it, I personally would say just do the digging and get something sustainable. But if you're not, open up your windows and let that room ventilate. Let the off-gassing go out. That sort of lighting and things like that. Uh, I suppose that's probably more about design, is it? Sort of colour, spectrum and things um, like that? Lighting comes for sustainability as well, I think, mm. in a sense that use that natural light that you've got in that space. 
A, if you, natural light is really good for your health and well-being, it's better for you than artificial lighting. Um, also, um, when you're doing lighting, uh, lighting changes throughout the year from winter to summer. So remember that, especially when you're choosing the colours for a room as well, that remember that it, what, what, what facing is this room? Is it north facing, east facing, south facing? Because that's going to affect how it's going to look in your space. But natural light is so so good for you for your mental well-being um and also it reduces your energy bills so if you can utilize as much natural light um that's really good and that's not just for home that's for your office as well mm. you know from the working spaces when you're doing lighting look for energy efficiency light bulbs you know just don't have too many lights in a space I mean, you can go into some places and they've got like a thousand spotlights in the ceiling. You're just like, oh, this is crazy. This is like Blackpool elimination. Yeah. And I think we'll look at, work out the spacing, at the proper spacing for the, if you want recess lights, look, do a layered lighted. So you have like a pendant light in the ceiling. You've got a nice um, floor lamp and then you might have a nice table lamp. So layer your lighting so that during the day, if you need the pendants, I'll have the pendants on, but nighttime, you don't want to have such a bright, vibrant space because you want to chill out and relax. So you could just have your table lamp on or your floor lamp on, but don't overlight the space because too much light, the sensors don't like it. Mm. But just really utilise that natural light. Uh, well, we've talked a little bit, but sort of soft furnishings, you know, duvet, mattress, things like that. Uh, obviously, we've spoken about wool being potentially problematic if you're vegan um, or problematic if you are vegan um, what what sort of what things should people be looking for like in a mattress or in a, a duvet you can use i think it's coconut these coconut shell bits mm -hmm. in the mattresses they use wool there's cotton safe mattresses which is a company i was speaking to they do the vegan mattress which has got no products in it um and it's got no chemicals on it make sure that it doesn't it's not if you can it's not sprayed with fire retardant because this if there's no chemicals on it the materials are used to make them outside the mattress are natural um the inside the mattress is no foam because <laughs> foam is just an offset from the petro uh, petrochemical industry mm -hmm. so if you and a lot of you go on a lot of web uh, natural mat in the uk if you look at their mattresses i think they've got coconut wool and i think it's a cotton thing on the outside um if you're in the us you've got avocado mattress which is really good because all i think of is an avocado when i when i when i say their name um so just you, and they actually give diagrams and if there's something you're not sure about you think oh has this got fire retardant on go to the company yeah and if you're not sure and they can't answer it then i would just say walk away yeah they they would know if they didn't have foam. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about foam because it's. Um, mm. I mean, I assume all foam. Well, I think I was reading that there's sort of a latex foam, isn't there? Yeah, latex is natural is a natural product, but then there might be people that have got latex allergies, which oh, yeah, it's not always a great thing. Wouldn't be the best thing uh, in a bed. Uh, no especially if it's a guest bed or something yeah. like <laughs> oh dear well then i've got one last thing that i'd like to talk about and um and that is the orbital shower oh isn't it amazing isn't it <laughs> sorry i get so excited by products like this it's just like i only found this out by an architect and then by reading enki mag yeah and it's it's based on the showers used by NASA. They they it's um oh they're gonna my slap my wrist. I think they're a Danish company. Um, it's available in Europe and Scandinavia. I'm not sure if it's come over to the UK yet, but I'm sure it must have by now. Um, what an amazing system! Your normal shower uses so much water. It's amazing you'd be shocked how much water you use. But the the orbital shower system is it recycles the water in your shower and the water actually turns out to be cleaner and healthier than just your normal shower because when it's going through the filtering process all the 
bacteria and stuff is filtered out. So it's recycled, filtered, put back, put yep. back onto your head. And yeah, yeah. Round and round and round. Yep, yep. And the great thing about it is, you can operate it by your smartphone, like everything these days. And in, in you, the shower. Yeah, you can operate it by a smart. It has a smartphone, so you can turn the shower on. And instead of like a normal shower where it takes time to heat up, right? This this comes on at a temperature. Oh, uh, and you know what? I hadn't even thought about that because I mean, obviously, if you heat water and then it all goes down the plug hole, you've just wasted all that energy. Yep. And there's some ways that people are are capturing the heat coming out of their uh, their shower to sort of re, mm. you know pass it back into the water that's going in. But this, and, just reusing the same water, you're keeping yeah, the Yeah, and also, and at the summit to do how they heat the water in the shower, it saves energy. To, it costs less energy to heat, and it saves on your water bill. So if you're on a water meter and you want to get your energy bills down, this is such a great, it's a really good, good product. I mean, why has it took so long for the world to, to think of yeah. it? If you think of a shower in a hotel room, if you've got a 50-bed hotel room and they've all got a normal shower how much shower water is getting energy is getting wasted just to heat and run a shower they are a bit costly than a normal shower but if you think about in the longevity how much energy and water you're going to save yeah I mean especially water I mean I think yes that's, that's going to be quite quickly the the sort of commodity that we need to, to yeah, yes. store the most yeah I mean I wonder what sort of um how many people would listen to this and go like, Ugh, you know, if there's a there's a factor uh, of, you know, disgust? Because it did. I think it said it monitored the waste or the wastewater. And, you know, if it's really dirty, it gets rid of it. It gets rid of it. Yes, it does. Yes. But I, I when I first I mean, this architect told me about it. I'm like, wow, that's super amazing. And it's but you'd say this is based. This is what they do in space. How yeah. fun would your kids think? Wow, Getting in the space my shower. mum and dad showers based on something from outer space. That's so cool. <laughs> so, you know, I think, and like you say, mo- most people are so conscious about how much water we're using and we're told to save water. And if energy bills going up, what a perfect, perfect thing. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. That was so great. Uh, Rachel has got her book. It's a link in the show notes to that. Uh, her website is great. Lots of really informative blog posts. There's a link to that, as well as her website. And also, what else have I got links in there too? Oh, the Healthy Materials Lab courses. Uh, I am just about to sign up to those. Uh, they start in the spring, I think. Uh, yes, get on them. You have lots of knowledge. Um, yeah, and as I say, there's a whole load of links to uh, all the things we talked about uh, in this conversation. Uh, what else to say? Oh, I wanted to thank John Butler because we recorded this episode just before myself and John sat down. And so we hadn't had our conversation about whether natural is the right term. Um, And now listening back, all I can hear is natural. Is it natural? But is it though? Mm. So uh, thanks, John. Uh, You've made my life just a little bit more difficult. (laughs) I mean that with utter love. (laughs) Um, And while I'm on it with a little bit of word pedantry, uh, traditional versus conventional in construction terms, uh, there was uh, an utterance of traditional building uh, to mean modern conventional building. And to me, traditional building is all the building that happened up until the Industrial Revolution uh, using largely local natural materials Uh, To me, conventional construction is the sort of new normal, uh, which has come about since then with plastics and speed over quality and modern materials. So my hope is obviously that the more we get in tune with what's healthy to live in and build with and all the embodied carbon of materials, then we should return to local and natural materials again. And then traditional and conventional will be the same thing. And my little rant here will be obsolete. We can dream.
there's a little bit of bonus audio uh, on the Patreon. We are up to nearly nine hours of bonus audio on there uh, for you to get into. There's only just a little five minutes of this conversation. Um, so yeah, head on to the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. Link in the show notes. All right, that is it for me. I hope you've had a wonderful year. It's been a strange one, hasn't it? Another strange one. Maybe next year we'll be normal again. <laughs> Doesn't look like it's going to start that way. Um, and I want to say, if you're listening to this in spring or summer or whenever, just I, I try to treat people today like like you've got that Christmas cheer uh, and you're feeling all festive and, and jolly. It shouldn't just be at the, the Christmas time of year, should it? OK, that's it. Until next time. Bye bye. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas.